This morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever mind we're in, for all that he is doing for us. And I want to just take, I know I'm a little early, but I felt the need to bring forth a little bit of a song. So I think now I'm just going to go ahead and uh, go into prayer. And I ask that you would pray with me as we would ask God to give us what do you have us to have for today? We know that he is who he says that he is, and that is all we need to know. And I ask that you would take this time that God has given you and be grateful. Let not your heart be troubled. To believe in God is also to believe in me. And I'm just here to tell you, I know he is an awesome God. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now, Lord. We ask that you would cover us in every way possible to hear your work, to hear your word, to be who you would have us to be. And we ask that you would set forth this Bible study today and let it be 
a magnificent word from heaven. I ask that you recover us, God. Keep us in your perfect will to do your work, to do your will, to do it your way. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our brothers and sisters, I thank you. I'm a little early on the watch party, so I'm just going to give a few moments for those who want to come in with us. Um, and I want to talk about some things that are transpiring. I want to encourage you all. I know that there's a lot going on right now in our great state and in our great country uh, in, in the realm of how the attempt to get us back to what some would call or most would call normal. And we have to consider that there are some things that we may uh, be doing for a while. There are some things that change is going to come. However, we may be uh, in it for a minute. But with that being said, I want to encourage you all into knowing that God's hand is upon it. It's placed for a reason and that he's looking for our involvement full time. So we cannot figure out uh, how God would have us to be if we're not in that proper place. Um, I know that Jesus has a plan for us and I know that he is going to take care of us. But I also know that we're going to have to figure out where God would take us. And so I'm asking right now for those of you who are in place that you would give us an opportunity for that to happen. Um, I'd ask right now that you would consider what you're going through in your families, in your homes. I cannot say enough the importance of anointing your homes, putting those things in place, setting them where they would be need to be. I would ask that you would take that time to not uh, misunderstand those concepts, those uh, those ideas that God's are placing. Um, but I do know that God is putting those things together for our benefit and for the greater good. Um, I don't know if you had the opportunity to anoint your homes. I would really, really encourage you to do that in the prayer of knowing that God is going to change some things, not adjust some things, but, but yet change some things. Um, and I ask that you would call, find a way to let him work with you in those changes. And in the midst of those changes, don't look at them as you're losing something in, in retrospect. I would say look at it, you're going to be gaining uh, much more than you think you're going to lose. And um, I don't know about you, but this isolation time, if you will, has really allowed me to self-reflect and try to figure out what God would have of me for the very near future, where he would place me, where he would want me to be, who would want me to help, and how he would want me to help them. Uh, sometimes in our lives, we have a concept of how we want to help people, um, and the part of wanting to help is not the, the challenge or the issue. It's how we're going to help them is where the direction of God will give you better insight. So for those of us out there today who we believe God has given us an assignment to help, uh, I would strongly urge you to go into prayer. Some of us need to go into fasting for that direction of how God is going to have us be that help and that kindness to them. So let's look at uh, today. We are getting ready for God to move. Um, we're a couple of minutes early, but that's fine. God directed it, so I just followed it. And uh, I want to look at, we're in our third topic of a series where we're talking about keys to a lasting ministry. Keys to a lasting ministry. Not just a lasting ministry, keys to a lasting relationship. Uh, keys to lasting in employment or a career, uh, keys to 
being steadfast and going back to school or in college are keys to our young people who are now adjusting to this new uh, technology of having to do the homework online, all of it, not some of it, not most of it, but all of it. And so I want to encourage all of our young people out there, all of our youth, um, I want to encourage you all into knowing that God has a great place for you um, and that this is only giving you the precursor to how college uh, can and will be for some of you uh, as you go back into that realm. Uh, there will be classes that you may end up doing online instead of being in the actual classroom in college. So this is only preparing you to be more studious about your time management skills. Time management is a key component uh, to how you're going to perform in college. And I know one of the hardest things to do, uh, sitting in a classroom is just a lot different from learning than when you are actually given the assignment and you have to go online and fill it out and do all that. It sounds easier, but what it is is now you have to have self-discipline to follow through. And there are a lot of people out in the world who are listening to me that can say amen on that one. So let's look, let's look here quickly what God would have us to, uh, to look at. But we're going to talk about value, 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 value. The word value, value, value. What does it mean to you? What does value mean to you? Value. When you think about it, when you hear that word value, uh, what comes into your mind? What, what, what gets you to, to thinking? What gets you to, to saying, I understand it. It's, it's part of who I am. It's, it's, it's my DNA, if you will. It's what I know I'm good at. You know, what do you think about when you hear the word value? When we look at a dictionary, value said it's of relative worth, merit, or importance. It's a monetary or a material worth as in commerce or trade. The worth of something in terms of the amount of other things. Hmm? It said for which it can be exchanged or in terms of some medium or exchange. It's an equivalent worth of return. Okay, estimated or assigned worth. Worth. Merit, importance, value. Let me help you. If you don't get over anything else tonight, I want you to put this in your brain. I want you to ride with it for a minute uh, as you go along the rest of the week. Okay. Value, value, I repeat, value is the access to everything you want to do in God. I repeat, value is access to everything you want to do in God. Whatever you give value to in the realm of God, access will be always be there. Now, are there sometimes delays or sometimes um, challenges to get there or situations that will cause you to feel like maybe this is not the right ride? Okay, that's, that's part of it. However, the access will never be denied to you. Whatever God has planned for you and you will learn to value it, he will get you access there. Eventually, it will manifest. It will come to pass. It will be in place. As long as you hold it in the value that God has given it to you. Now, now, out of grace, does he not let us do some of the things we want to do? Yes, yes. He'll allow us to obtain certain things or venture into certain um, assignments, or if you will, but I still think his hand is upon how it finishes out or how the process works. So you better have value in it and keep God in that value while you go through those things that you desire. And so it's possible that your desires can match God's decision because of his love for you and his value of what you value with him. He will allow you also to have some luxuries, if you will, in life. I truly believe that. That I do believe. So let's look here. Uh, we're talking about value tonight. Um, and those of you who are uh, Facebook live and feel free to, to add in um, little um, inserts on your page because you'd be surprised how many people are in concurrence with you and will amen and hallow you as well as God gives it to you. So we're talking about value. So let's look at a familiar passage in the book of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah. Now we know Nehemiah was written uh, by the prophet Ezra. And this design was uh, to provide a, a, a just a backward account of, of how the, the return and the restoration of building the wall was needed. And uh, 
Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king, and he, uh, the king noticed, if you go back and look at the chapters, in the first and the second chapter, the king noticed that Nehemiah was sad. Now, he asked Nehemiah what was wrong. Now, did he have to? No, not really. Why? He was the king. He, what would he care about how the cupbearer feel? But this is how the move of God, how he will place people who are in higher positions, he will allow them to see your spirit. Now, he looked at Nehemiah and probably said, why are you sad? But the spirit was telling the spirit that the spirit needed to be encouraged. And I want to encourage somebody today. Do you have that kind of spirit that you can see that you need to encourage someone? Can you see that? Can God show it to you? Can you be uplifting? Can you be encouraging? Can you be edifying? And can you really be truthful? Now, understanding that the edifying of someone is for the edifying of the spirit, not necessarily their feelings. Now, that, 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 may, that may take a minute for the process, but you catch that on the way home. When you're trying to edify someone, you're trying to edify the spirit of someone. And sometimes it doesn't always match up with the flesh or the emotions of someone. Does that mean you do not care? If you look at Jesus, you look at the statements that he made and the things that he, pr that he pronounced and the questions that he asked and the statements that he made, they seem very, very direct. But they were loving in the direction that they were given. You could really misconstrue if you're not paying attention to the scripture, how it's written in the spiritual sense, not the literal sense. God was trying to open the eyes. So, so the king's asking him, what's wrong? He's saying, you know, I, I, I want to go home. My, 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 my country is, is falling apart. Uh, they've lost their lock. They've lost their luster for God. Uh, my God, they, they, they've lost the, the ability to, to, to pronounce that he is still uh, our, our opening and our closing, our beginning and our end. And I believe God is functioning. And so he told him to pray about it. Nehemiah prays about it. He says, I must go. And now Nehemiah was smart enough to know, well, if I'm going to go on my own, even if the king allows me to go, I can't cross all this land without some papers. I need some bona fide. That's what we used to call it back in the day. You have to be bona fide. And so the, the king writ, uh, gave him some written papers with his stamp, and that stamp means that he was approved to travel wherever he needed to travel. And he, and, he, and he gave that ability to travel, and he put that out, and he began to say over and over and over again, that, you know, I'm going to a land to take care of my people. And all he had to do was just show the paper. Once the, the soldiers or whoever stopped him saw that the paper, all they literally looked at, they didn't even care about the writing. All they needed to see was the seal. Once they saw the seal, they didn't even have to open the paperwork up. Once they saw the seal that was placed on the front of the paper, they allowed them to pass. What am I saying? God has the ability to put a stamp on your life that no matter where you go, no matter where you wind up, all they'll have to see is the seal of God's approval on you, and they got to let you pass. They got to they, they get their hands off you. They got to get their mouth off you. They got to leave you alone. And so Nehemiah gets there. And the Bible says when he got there, he decided to go and look at the wall for himself. He didn't go and ask nobody. He didn't go and talk with nobody. He didn't go meet with the elders. He didn't go try to go by and check on nobody. He went and looked at it for himself. And then he came back and began to talk with the people of God and say that our work is needed at the wall. It's needed. And then they said there were some other gentlemen there that were um, haters. Haters of the player. Player haters. Y'all know them. And their design was to try to cause some ill will with the heart of what Nehemiah was trying to do. So they began to say, well, you want to try to do something to, to ruffle the people up. Nehemiah says, no, I'm trying to restore honor into who we say we believe God is to us. And I think we need to do that, not just from a spiritual nature, but it ought to manifest into us doing something physically. And we really, really think about it. All Nehemiah was doing was trying to make sure that his life matched his lips. And you have to think about that. If you are the kind of person who talks really, really good about how good God is to you, you post a lot of stuff on your page, and you, you got a scripture or a song, or you, you can quote stuff all day long to people, sounds really good. At the end of the day, 
can people look at you and say, man, that brother, he wide open for the Lord. Man, that sister, she, she just, man, she won't even slow down. She, she's doing everything she can to try to please God and to be in place to help his people and to help his places and help his things. That's the kind of person that God wants you to be. Now, let me say this. It comes with a price. It look good on paper, but it's a challenge because people become one or two things. They either become impressed or they become intimidated. And all you're trying to do is serve God. You just have to make sure that it's done properly. So we go here to the book. And let's look in the sixth chapter here. Nehemiah chapter six. Help me. Someone post that for me on that. Nehemiah chapter six. Okay. Now, this is an important chapter here. Nehemiah's already up. He's doing the work. He's not waiting around for nobody. He's not begging nobody to help him. He's just doing what God told him to do. Amen? That's what, that's, what he, that's what he's trying to do. He's asking God to put some things in place so he can get some things done. So it says here, it says, Now it came to pass when Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall. And there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gate. That Sambalot and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in, in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought it to do mischief, to do me mischief. Now, he already knew that their folk was trying to talk him out of what he's supposed to be doing. And I want to encourage somebody. What do you do when you know you're around somebody that don't mean you no good? How do you react? How do you deal with when you know somebody's trying to say something to you and do something to you that you know they don't mean you no good. Do you get so caught up in what they're trying to do to you that you're not doing God's work? Do you get so caught up in what they're saying that you quit talking about God and you end up talking more about the situation with them? I'm going to be transparent. You have to catch yourself and make sure that you're not letting whatever they're saying and doing cause you to become the very thing you hate. Because if you're not careful, the very thing you hate, you will become. So he says here, he said, and I sent messengers unto them. Now, now check this out. They came to tell him about some things, but he sent messengers. He wouldn't even finish a conversation with them. He wouldn't even go, and, no, I'm not coming over there. I'm not coming to talk to y'all. I'm not going to deal with y'all. And that's what sometimes I think we make the mistake. It's amazing how people who don't know God make sure we don't get over on them. And those of us who know God let everybody get over on us. <laughs> Let me try that again. It's amazing how people who don't know God make sure we don't get over on them. And those of us who know God, hear God, listen to God, follow God, let everybody get over on us. Hmm. So he says, and I sent a messenger unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why? Why? Should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Now, listen, when you read that now, some people might say, well, Nehemiah thought he was better than them. No. Nehemiah would say, I'm not better than you, yet I'm different from you. And because I'm different from you, God is making me better. And I want to encourage somebody that when God gives you an assignment, don't you allow nobody to talk you out of that assignment because it looks like you're doing what God's telling you to do, but to them it looks like you don't care about anybody else but yourself. That's not, the, that's not what's going on. When you value something, then that's where your attention and your focus goes. So you have to ask yourself, am I a valued Christian? When you go to the, back in the day, Walmart and all these other stores, they used to have the signs up when you first come in. And what would they call it, bro, Rick? You are a valued customer. Valued customer. That meant when you walked in the door, you meant something to that business just because you walked in the store even before you bought anything. And so you have to ask yourself, am I a valued Christian? That even before I get out of my car to walk into the parking lot, to walk into the church, I already know I'm valued through Christ. 
before I get out of my car to walk into my business where I work or where I own, whether I walk into the classroom, whether I walk into the schoolwork for my young people tonight, you have to ask yourself, am I a valued Christian? Do I value it? Not them. Do I value it? Because you can put up all the signs you want that says value. If I don't value it, guess what? It has no value. It is up to me. So he says, I sent messages unto them saying, I am doing a great work. Let me help somebody. The only way to do a great work, you must be grateful. In order to do a great work, you must be grateful. Let me help you. All the brothers that wind up in the Hall of Fame in football, they get a speech. They get the gold jacket. Every one of them, as they're talking and they're giving their speech, all show a sign of humbleness and gratefulness. That's how you know they did a great work. Yes, their stats got them there, but they were humble enough at the end of it all to say if it had not been for the Lord. Now, everyone doesn't say that, but I'm just giving you the, the reaction of how we should look at it from a spiritual nature. When you come in to do God's work, God's will, God's way, are you humble and excited about it to say, if it had not been for the Lord, I couldn't open this door and say, welcome to Mount Zion. If it had not been for the Lord, I could not be on my job and say, thank you for coming today. If it had not been for the Lord, where is my gratefulness? And that's where your greatness is. If I don't value it, I can't volume it. Oh, my God, that's a T-shirt. If I don't value it, I cannot volume it. Look what he says here. He said, I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? And when you value something, guys, you are not distracted by it. anything anybody else say, anything else anybody do, anything else anybody try to bring to you. You know, you focused. You value it. Isn't it amazing how funny somebody at car says, hey, man, what you get off? Man, I can't get off work. Look how I valued the job I was on, just like that. But then somebody asked me why I come in the Bible and said, man, I don't know if I'll make that. I twist the value. And I'm just using those two analogies. It doesn't mean that, that I'm trying to say one thing or the other. Don't twist it. Stay with me. Look what I'm saying, though. If I don't value whatever I believe I should value, then I just don't value it. And if I don't value it, it carries little value to anyone else around me in that circle. He says, yet they sent unto me four times after this sort. Not only did he send down and tell them, no, I'm not coming. They came four more times. Sent four more times. Hey, man, come on down off the wall. Please come off the job. Please don't do God work. Please don't do God will. Please don't do God way. Please don't do God's word. Huh? How many times, guys, have we taken the value of what God has given us and threw it out the pot? So my first point is simply saying this. In order to have this value, value has to have your attention. Whatever you value has your attention. He says, why should the work stop whilst I leave it and come down to you? I want to encourage somebody today. Just hear it from the Lord. You've lost value in what God told you to do. You got caught up in somebody. You got caught up in some place or you got caught up in something. I don't know what it is. I'm just telling you who are listening to me, you drop your value. I used to tell people all the time, don't ever lower your standards to raise your numbers. Don't ever lower your standards to raise your numbers. What am I saying? Don't lower your value to raise your volume. Don't do it. Listen, let, can we be transparent for a minute? We all know what's wrong with us. We don't have to come up into the altar and let somebody, you know, 
tell us in, the, in a whisper in our ear what our problem is. Now, that's confirmation. But we already knew that before we got up and walked up to the altar. The dilemma is once we're told that God gives us the revelation of what's wrong with us, the man gives us the confirmation of what's wrong with us, we go back and sit down and we don't change nothing, Rick. We sit right there on Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Pastor Harrison, we sit there another week and another week and another week and another week. And I don't care how many times we come up and let you put hands on us and rub us with oil till we grease it like KFC chicken. We still sitting there with no value, so we got no volume. So we got to start asking ourselves, what must we do to be saved? I'm going to be honest and transparent. That's a daily thing for me. God, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? What must I do? What must I do? Because I don't ever want this thing to be figured like I got it all figured out every day of my life. I, I want to know every morning, Lord. You are the author and finisher of my faith. My confession and my belief in you, you said I shall be saved. So I'm going to make sure I'm confessing and believing. In other words, I'm going to give volume to what I say. I'm going to give volume to what I think. I'm going to give volume to what I do. These are key ingredients that we must not give up on. So he's looking at us here. He's trying to give us an understanding. So then he says, He's telling us, and I sent messages to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Think about that. Value has to have my attention. That's what value has to have. It has to have my attention. Do you, whatever you value is where your attention is. It's where your attention is going to be. If you value your marriage, that's where your attention is going to be. If you value your children, that's where your attention is going to be. Whatever you value, God will give you the ability to move forward in life and get things done holistically. However, whatever you give value to that is not beneficial to you, that's where your mind is. That's where your heart is. If, your mind, if you give value to the depression you're going through, that's where your mind is. That's where your volume is. If you give value to the anger that's inside of you, that's bursting out of you, that's where your volume is. That's where your value is. These things don't change, guys, unless you wish them to change. The only way, it's saying here in Nehemiah, in order to do a great work, you must be grateful. I hope I'm helping somebody tonight. So let's look at another verse. I want to go to Proverbs 16. Somebody help me find that. Proverbs, 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 chapter 16. Somebody grab that for me. Amen. Proverbs 16. Now, we know Proverbs is one of the great Old Testament books written by uh, King Solomon and uh, yes, some other authors as well. And it invites us into life-changing decisions. Pro Proverbs deals with family. Proverbs deals with friends. Proverbs deals with co-workers. You know, Proverbs deals with uh, individually how we act and how we cooperate and how we do things. Proverbs is very, very, very uh, open to us and how God would have us to be. But let's look at this. Chapter 16. That's a familiar text. He says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Commit your work to who? The Lord, and your plans will be established. So now we're looking at, we're talking about keys to a lasting ministry. We're talking about value, right? So now he's talking about here, committing your work to the Lord, and your plans be established. The first of all, we talked about Value you have to has, you, has to have your attention. Now we're talking about value has to have your attendance. Your attendance. Huh? Whatever your attention is, is where you're going to try to place yourself. Is where you're going to try to put yourself. Is where you're going to try to place yourself to be. You're not going to allow yourself to be caught up and lose value in what you're doing. You 
remember how when you first uh, got on a new job, man, you wanted to be there early. You, you couldn't, you press your uniform, you look real nice. You, you know, you came in with a smile on your face. You, you were happy and excited. Then you had a challenge. Then you had a struggle. And if you ain't careful, you end up with a stronghold. And the next thing you know, now you devalued the job. You went to work, but you didn't have the enthusiasm and the zeal that you once had. We're talking about keys to the last ministry. You lost value. I always tell people, weddings are good. Honeymoons are good. Anniversaries are great. The longer you're able to carry yourself through something, the more grateful you're going to become. Let's be real about it. Some folk just got the lily pad spirit. <laughs> What's the lily pad spirit, you ask? I'm glad you asked. As soon as it gets a little warm, they hopping. That's called a lily pad spirit. They never can truly find a home because they don't value where they're sitting. But once you begin to value where you're sitting, can't nothing move you off the pot. Can't nothing get you off of what you're doing. You know how you first joined the ministry? Man, you couldn't stop smiling and sniggling and giggling. And Man, I, I love my church. I love my church people. I love my pastor and wife. I love the leaders. I love everybody that's in the church. Man, I One little incident. One mistake, you done lost the miracle. The devil is a liar. Church is the place, guys. When mistakes come up, but miracles still happen. I repeat, church is a place where mistakes come up, but miracles still happen. Because we believe that at the end of the day, we got to find a way to fix it. Now, let me be honest with you. You're going to have issues in life where everybody don't want to fix it. Everybody, is, you know, they want, they want to do whatever they want to do. They want to say whatever they want to say, and that's fine. You just make sure you're clearing your heart. You're asking God to rinse whatever does not belong in there. You want to be whiter than snow that God can deal with you the way he wants to deal with you so you can keep the value and the standard. The standard. Do I have any standard people today? Can I get at least five people to text me out? I got a standard, and it's called Jesus. Amen. Thank you. I see two popped up right quick. Value has your attendance. He says, commit your work. How can you commit to working if you're not in place for the work? Hmm? And you got to think spiritually. You got to go a little deeper than that. Because it's not just being at the place. It's about being in the place. It's not just being physically. There's an old, 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 old secular song. I know, Brother Rick, you was in church all your life. You may not know this song. It said, my body's here with you, but my mind is on the other side of town. I'm at work, but I'm not in the work. Can I go deeper than that? I'm at work, but I'm not in the word. Because if I'm in the word, the word do the work. And that's where we're falling short. We're doing whatever we're doing for God from a physical nature because we've learned how to manipulate how to do it. And I want to encourage somebody, let's get off our high horses. Let's get out these Pentecostal pity parties. Let's take away our pride and let's enjoy the ride. And say, God, I need you to keep me with zeal to do your work, to do your will, to do it your way. And, Lord, teach me how to not come down off the wall for these folk who really don't want to do what you're asking them to do. They just don't want me doing it. You know what's really amazing? Let's be transparent for us. Isn't it amazing when we was in the club, nobody told us to slow down? Nobody told us, look, you work, you, you, man, don't, look, don't be late going to work tomorrow because you've been up all night at the club. Nobody came by. Nobody stopped us. 
Soon as I'm starting to do some work for Jesus, all them people over there taking all your money. All them folk got you wide open. You the, you, the, you, the, you pastor's pet. You first lady's little girl. You run around and grab her shoes and slip them. You bringing her this, you doing what? Out of all the stuff they did to me at the club, all, of, all the money they beat me out of, all the drinks I bought, didn't get nothing back. Maybe it's just me. I, I mean, y'all didn't, y'all didn't do all that. All y'all were church people. But for some of us, we got abused huh, and misused in the game. Because in the reality, we had a heart to do right, even when we were doing wrong. Now, that just helped somebody. Hmm? He says, commit your work to the Lord. And if what you're trying to do is through the word of God, then it's going to be to the glory of God first. Not because you're smart at it. Not because you're good at it. Not because people pat you on the back about it. Not because people say, oh, boy, I couldn't wait to hear this or I couldn't wait to see that. It's because you believe God is pleased. And because you believe God is pleased, somebody gets changed. Not adjusted. They change, man. I tell all of my preachers, listen, preaching and teaching is nothing more than a moment to change a mentality. That's all it is. It's a moment to change a mentality. You have the power within you to change someone's mentality on what they thought life was really all about. You have that power. You. I'm talking to you. You have that power. The question is, will you keep the value up so the volume of God stays up within you? So then he says, not only commit your work to the Lord, there's a comma. That means pause. Because you don't even get the second part of this verse until the first part has been understood. I'm understanding that if I commit my work to the Lord, he says, and your plans will be established. You caught that? Commit your work to the Lord, comma, pause, and your plans will be established. Hence the problem. Our plans are not being established because we have not committed the work slash the word to the Lord. Guys, listen, this thing is not complicated. It's probably more simple than it is anything else in your life, and maybe that's the scare. It can't be that easy. It is just that easy. If, you, if you're willing to commit everything you owe in life to God, anything you are going to do to God, anywhere you are going to go to God, he says your plans will be established. Now, let me help you with that. Even after he establishes it, you still have to commit the work to keep it. (laughs) Huh? Now, what if I did everything I was supposed to do to start a ministry, but then along the way I'm doing my own thing? Hmm. You don't think I'm about to answer to that one day? I know what you're probably saying. Oh, there's a lot of pastors out there. They ain't doing right. That's fine. I call it seeing it again. I was telling some people, we were actually talking with a, with a good deacon friend of mine today, and we were talking about when uh, God told David he could no longer, he was not going to allow him to build a temple. And the Holy Spirit gave me this. He said because he had what? Too much blood where? On his hands, right? And so immediately we thought all the warring and all the fighting that David had done for God, he had killed too many people. He just had too much on his hand, too much blood. But that wasn't what God was talking about. For whatever, whatever was done wrong, God washed it whiter than snow. Here was the problem. God was upset with him where he had got Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, killed in battle so just he could have Bathsheba. That was done outside of the will of God. So that was blood on David's hands, not God's. 
everything he had done for God, God had cleaned. And I stopped by to encourage somebody that the work you're doing for God, even the mistakes you make along the way, if your heart is still to do it for God, repenting of your sins throughout that process, God will take care of that. He says, I can close the door no man opens. I can open the door no man closes. That means he can wash whatever needs to be washed. However, even though he forgave David, that does not mean there's not a consequence. Let's go to another one. He loved Moses. Moses let them people overwhelm his mind because Moses, God wasn't testing Moses when he told him to speak to the rock, not touch it. He was testing the people. Moses got confused and got upset. And though God forgave him, what was the consequence? He was not allowed to enter into Canaan. However, how do you know that Moses was forgiven? Was he not on the mountain with Jesus and Elijah at the transfiguration? So he still made what he needed to make with God. However, the consequence was an example for the people of what happens when you do not Follow in obedience and sacrifice unto God. What am I saying? There are things, guys, that we have done. Yes, God has forgiven us. However, he can still take that mistake, let it be seen for a reason to uplift someone else later as a miracle. So quit saying God picking on you because he got bigger things to do. So we're finding out, we're talking about keys to a lasting ministry. Amen? And I got to give some side props to, to the greatest church my side of heaven, Mount Zion Tabernacle. I love the work that you guys are doing right now on a daily basis. I just had a leaders meeting uh, via teleconference, uh, Zoom, the other night, and we were just talking about how we have to make sure we're doing great things in the midst of all that's going on so we can stay grateful. And I'm going to encourage every member that can hear my sound of my voice right now, let not your heart be troubled. Do not be distracted to where you're not even, that you're not just isolated, but now you're separated. I say it again. We understand the isolation. Don't get separation. God needs you. We need you. You need us. We need God. You see how what I'm saying is how this going around? So we're understanding now that value has to have our attention. And then value has to have our attendance. Amen? Because even after it's established, we have to be present throughout the process therein from then on. This walk with Christianity, you can't be an absent Christian. You've got to be in the spirit of God. That includes being in the building, but not being the church. You're absent. Physically, you're here, but spiritually, you're somewhere else. Not going to benefit anybody. So let's look at the book of Luke. I want to go to the book of Luke. Let's see. Luke, 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 New Testament. Amen? Luke. Luke, the physician, y'all know Luke, wrote Luke and the book of Acts. Luke. Okay, Luke was a, a doctor. He was a Gentile that followed Paul. He was one of Paul's disciples. And he really wanted to show the compassion of Jesus as much as he could. So he was very thorough and very specific in his writings to make sure that people could understand clearly just how precious Jesus was. And for those of us who like a key verse out of that, go to uh, Luke 2 and uh, 10 and 11, save that for later. But he talks about, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. That's powerful. Good news. The good news. Y'all ever hear about the good news? That's the good news of, God, of Jesus. 
The good news is, guys, he's here. He's in our lives. He wants to use us. He wants to use you. Yes, I know you got some things that you've done. I know you got some things you probably still are doing. But I'm telling you, today could be your last day that you have to keep carrying this stuff on your heart that you can't move forward in God. We have to stop beating ourselves up to a point that we cannot be beneficial to the Holy Ghost. As long as we stay convicted, there's opportunity for our conversion. That's where we stay. So Luke, in chapter 21, verse 36. Somebody type that in for me. Luke, chapter 21, verse 36. And we've done, the other two scriptures tonight have been Nehemiah, 6 and 3. And the point was value has our attention. Second point was Proverbs 16 and 3. And that was value has our attendance. Amen. Type that in for me. Thank you, guys. And now Luke 21 and 36. He says, but stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the man of God. Think about that. We got to figure out where God would have us to be, what he would have us to do, how he would have us to do it. He says, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Listen, guys, what we're going to go, on through, go through is going to happen anyway. Right? So the key to that is, why not be prepared in Christ? Why not? Why not be prepared to go through these things anyway? Don't allow yourself to be caught up, hemmed up, tracked down, messed up. Just put yourself in the mindset of knowing God is going to do what he's going to do, place it where he's going to place it, put us where he's going to put us. All we got to do is follow through. Not get out of it, go through it. True Christians understand that it's not about getting out of anything. It's about going through something so God can encourage us in our walk that he wants us to be. So he says, watch therefore. You got to be paying attention, guys. But all he's really talking about is our spirits, our atonement. Do you value it? Huh? Do you? These are the things he's trying to get us to see. Think about this. He says, but stay awake at all times. Watch therefore. He says, praying that you may have strength to escape. Not some things, not most things. All these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Huh? Value has your atonement. Huh? We're talking about keys to a lasting ministry. Value. Value has to have our attention. Value has to have our attendance. Now it's saying value has to have our atonement. Our amends. Our repentance. Coming to God and saying, I'm sorry. Lord, I want you to fix it. Fix me. Give me the spirit of understanding where you would have me to be. And Lord, don't let me lay comfortable in it. That's one of the true things that we have to be really honest with ourselves about. If we're able to lie in our own sins on a regular basis and it doesn't bother us at all, it doesn't bring any kind of attention, it doesn't bring any type of attendance, it doesn't bring any type of atonement to us, then we got no value. We can't have a value in God. He says, choose, hot or cold. Can't be lukewarm, brothers and sisters. Yes, do we make mistakes along the way? Yes, we do. Do we come short here and there? Yes, we do. 
However, we still, we still strive to press toward the mark, the calling of the true God, no matter what comes before us. And we do it with joy. Joy. So I want to encourage somebody today. Do you plan to last? If so, where's your attention? Where's your attendance? Where's your atonement? Why is it so hard for you to say, hey, look, what, gotta, what, what must I do to be saved? How can I fix this? What can we put in place? What stipulation do I have to go through, go by? Not my will, but thy will be done. My brothers and sisters, this is a time and a season. Well, if you have not had the chance to know the Lord and part of your sin, it's so apparent now. I don't know how the way. The world has stopped and is trying to restart again. The world at one point was shut down. Yes, people still run around doing what they wanted to do, but the spirit of the world as we knew it was shut down. So now, God is starting this back up. And I think he's given us an opportunity to help rewrite the story. And so I want to ask you today, are you willing to help rewrite the story? Are you willing to let God deal with you like never before? Let's pray. Heavenly and gracious Father, we thank you today for your spirit. We ask that you would cover us, Lord, in the pardon of our sins. God, we ask that you would begin to, if anyone would be today, Lord, that they love you and they want to accept you as their Lord and Savior, that they would raise their hands right now as a sign of submission. And say, Lord, I receive you unto myself. I ask that you forgive me for all of my sins. And please come into my life as my Lord and my Savior. Lord, you're also saying, Lord, I know you for myself. But I don't have a church home. I don't have a place of accountability. Give me the spirit now to make a call, to make an inbox to the place you would have me to be that I can become a working member through the word of God. To be a blessing to be accepted, to be held accountable, responsible, and reliable as a Christian of this walk. We ask this now in the name of Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, rose on the third day with all power, ascended into heaven, and coming back again soon. We ask this now in his name. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I thank you again for a wonderful time. I cannot thank you enough for being in place. I ask right now that you will continue to let God be the guide for your life. Let not your heart be troubled. Please, 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 this is not the time. Even though there's isolation, this is not the time for separation. Stand with God. Stand with his people. Trust the leadership God has given you. And if you can't, find who you can trust and put it there in the name of Jesus. But I always say with that, make sure you're self-reflecting, self-evaluating, so that God can use you for his work, for his will, for his way. My brothers and sisters, we thank you again. On behalf of me, my beautiful wife, First Lady Tamika Murray, and the Mount Zion Tabernacle Christian family, please, please, please keep us in your prayers as we will keep you in ours. Mount Zion Tabernacle Christian Church, where all you need is a touch from him. Good night.